Hey guys, it's Shaylin. I'm here today with another episode of Recent Reads. This is where I just chat about books I've read recently. I'm pretty excited for this group of books. There are a lot of really cool books in this batch. In my last Recent Reads, I talked about how I'd noticed my TBR had really piled up and that there were a bunch of books I kept just like not reaching for and I was trying to get through them, trying to get through basically all the books that continually sink to the bottom of my TBR and that I kept not reading. So that video was mostly those books. This video, I kind of have the end of that, I think maybe about half of this. And then the other half is actually like 2020 releases. So the first book I have to talk about is Godshot by Chelsea Beaker. This had been one of my most anticipated releases of the year. It was so perfectly tailored to all of my niche interests. This is about a girl who's grown up in a cult. Like when you talk about book marketing, you often talk about having like an ideal target reader, which is like a hypothetical person that you think of who's like, the most ideal reader for your book. And then you try to market to that hypothetical person. Free marketing tips uh, in this video. Consider that one on the house. I could be the hypothetical ideal target reader for this book. I did enjoy this. It wasn't my favorite thing ever. It's not that I really have any criticisms for why I didn't adore it, like why I didn't rate it five stars. It's just that it didn't wow me enough. It was really good in a lot of respects, it just wasn't quite there in terms of impact or enjoyment for me to be like, this is a new favorite of mine, you know? I think my only real main criticism of the book is that I didn't really like the ending. I felt it was totally inconsistent with the rest of the book. I felt it was overly sentimental. Not saying books have to end tragically or sadly. I think the same, maybe the same things could have happened, but tonally it was just too like saccharine, I guess. Um, to use an extremely pretentious word. So the next book I have is a quite an interesting one. It's I Who Have Never Known Men by Jacqueline Hartman. I believe this is translated from French. We follow a nameless main character who lives in underground in a cage with 30 other women and they're the only people she has ever known. There are male guards that they don't speak to and don't interact with and that's their daily life. There's really no explanation to it. The other women have vague, le vague recollections of their lives the main character is much younger. She's the only young one. Everything changes one day when they escape under strange circumstances. I have mixed feelings about this and a lot of reviews say that this is a book about like what it means to be human and they seem to approach the book on a very thematic level. I guess I see that for me like there's not actually really that much insight to really qualify it as something that I got thematic takeaway from. I think maybe what it's supposed to be is an interesting look at a character who doesn't have and has never had society or culture. Like she's essentially like a pure being in that she's unsocialized, but like she is still socialized. Like the society she lives in is just extremely small and it's a society without context. But like she basically is someone who exists with absolutely no context for all of human society and history. But I actually don't feel like really anything was drawn from that promise. There is a lot of intrigue because you don't know what's going on the whole book. And I guess I really was clinging to this hope that I would get answers. But then I got to the end and literally nothing is explained. Like there's no explanation as to where they are or what's going on or why they are where they are. If you were reading this and you were drawn in thematically, maybe you wouldn't need the satisfaction of like concrete answer. But I wasn't really that intrigued thematically. I didn't really feel the book was providing me unique insight on human nature. And so I really just wanted to know what was going on. <laughs> However, this is making it sound like I really disliked this, which I didn't. There were things I enjoyed about it. I didn't dislike the process of reading it. There's a calmness to this and like a quietness. Like you can feel this sense of silence, which is really fascinating. It is intriguing. So next up we have a collection, Intimations by Alexandra Kleeman. I read Alexandra Kleeman's novel, You Two Can Have a Body Like Mine, earlier in the year. And I was very intrigued by it. I'm very intrigued by her as a writer. She really interests me and like what she's doing really interests me. So I was pretty interested to check this out. There are three sections and I really enjoyed the first and third section. The middle focuses more around one character, Karen, and I really didn't enjoy the Karen stories. Those ones really fell flat for me. I didn't really get anything out of them, but I really, really enjoyed the stories in the first and third. Those ones I think implemented weirdness 
in her very specific way of writing that is very effective. I saw an article that said that she writes like an alien on an anthropological mission to Earth, which I think is very accurate. There's like an uncanniness to her writing that I greatly enjoy. So this is probably my favorite book in the video, and it's Luster by Raven Leilani. This is one of the books that was on my like most anticipated reads of 2020 list. So this book follows a 23 year old woman named Eddie. She works in publishing. And at the beginning of the book, she's just started dating a man who is in an open marriage. She's the first person he's seen other than his wife. As she becomes kind of enrolled in his family, she meets his adopted daughter and Eddie realizes that she's now the only black person in the daughter's life. I could talk about how much I adore this book for ages. It's one of my favorite books I have read this year. I don't have a single negative thing to say about this book. First of all, is the prose incredibly specific detail-oriented writing here. The detail choice is impeccable and surprising and funny and delightful. Just on a detail level and a prose level, this is impeccably written. Second of all is the absolutely incredible protagonist work. Eddie is one of the best protagonists I have read ever. She's tenderly written, also with humor, and with just like a complete realness. She's just one of those rare protagonists that has that extra spark of life to her where you just fully believe she's a real person and you're given so much intimacy um, to her character. I also really wanna talk about how this book uses humor. It's extremely effective. I think the humor does something extremely specific and it's use humor to emphasize humanity and loneliness. There were so many passages where I would actually laugh out loud and then a few sentences later be devastated and part of it was because of that emotional pairing and also the way that the character was using humor to cope. I don't know, I feel like that is such a relatable thing. What's more relatable than mining your trauma for comedy? Really nothing. <laughs> I was completely hypnotized by this book. I could not put it down. I read a really great interview with the author about this book where she says that she wanted Eddie to make the same mistakes over and over and over again even though it goes against what you would typically be taught is good character writing and good structure. Honestly, that's not real to how people work. I love that instead of trying to fit this character into a linear arc, she let the character be very messy and make mistakes and make the same mistakes and not put the pressure on the character to have to grow from every single thing that happens in a linear way. Honestly, this character is too real for that. Like, she is a too realistically and deeply rendered character to be, like, shoved into narrative structure. The character had that room to breathe. Sure, it might frustrate some people, but to me, it made the character and the writing feel so much more organic. You know, one of my favorite qualities in a, in a book is when I'm reading a book and I forget that it's a book. I forget there's an author I forget there's a binding. I'm just aware of the story and it feels completely real. And I had that with this book. I wish Eddie had Twitter. <laughs> I just feel like she would be very funny on Twitter. Uh, and I wish she was real so that I could follow her on Twitter. So next up we have The Virgin Suicides by Jeffrey Eugenies. I picked this up a while ago because it's kind of a modern classic. I feel like everyone talks about it and I haven't read it. After reading reviews, I kind of started to think I wouldn't like it. It's very rare that I read a book thinking I won't like it. Like, I'm not the kind of person to hate read a book. Every book I pick up, I pick up because I genuinely think I'll like it because I don't want to waste my time. I had bought it, so I feel like I should give it a chance, and I actually really enjoyed this. This is a novel told from a collective perspective of a group of boys as they witness the suicides of an entire family of sisters. Um, over the course of a year. I actually didn't know that this was told from a collective perspective going in. I thought it was just like a typical normal, I don't know. I don't know what I thought it was, but it was told from a collective perspective, which I thought was handled very organically. This book definitely feels very organically written, which as I mentioned earlier, I really appreciate. This is a very disturbing book because of the perspective. Because it's told from the perspective of this group of boys, they're observing this tragedy with fascination rather than grief. And so it's pretty disturbing because of the emotional angle that they take. The structure is pretty floaty and hazy. Everything kind of blurs together in terms of scene. 
Sometimes I liked this and I do think it worked with the perspective, though it did lose me on occasion. As a main critique, I think there were just some of the Lisbon girls that we didn't get enough from. Cecilia and Lux were both given a lot of development, but the other sisters were not really given the same attention on the page. It's a pretty uncomfortable read. The boys are very obsessed with the Lisbon girls. They see them as like mythical and fascinating and they very much romanticize their pain and obviously they're external observers so there isn't that like window into how they're actually feeling and so it is very uncomfortable. The narrative voice isn't a reflection of morality or like what should be or how they should be perceived. It's just a reflection of the moral complexity of the collective narrative. This book is objectively from the male gaze and I've seen that mentioned as a critique. Is it very uncomfortable? Yes, but it's intentionally what the book is meant to be. Like that's the point. So I have no issue with it. Like I felt uncomfortable reading it, but just because I feel uncomfortable doesn't mean it's a bad book. I think it means that it was quite effective in doing what it was trying to do. I also actually really appreciated the way that the discomfort was actually maintained as a form of narrative tension, almost like a horror novel. So the next book I've got to talk about is The Death of Vivek Oji by Akwake Avezi. I really adored Freshwater, so this was definitely one of my most anticipated reads of the year. This is a very non-linear novel. It begins with the title, with the death of Vivek Oji, um, and we get a portrait of his family and also the, like, just the people around him in a non-linear way leading back up to that event. This is a very harmonious novel, I think, with a lot of different elements and characters that all work together cohesively. It's a pretty sprawling cast, but they're all very interesting, and there are a lot of very interesting relationships relationship types that I don't often see explored in fiction, but that I thought were very interestingly portrayed here. It's also a great example of non-linear tension building. The tension here is built completely out of order. There's a linearity to the non-linearity, if that makes sense, and I feel like that's the sign of a good non-linear novel, is that even though it builds non-linearly, you get the sense that that's the best way to tell the story, because that's where the narrative arc is. Perhaps there were maybe too many point of view characters. It's tricky because on one hand I do think all the characters and point of views did work together pretty harmoniously, but it's also a pretty short book with a lot of point of views, and so I do think there's some amount of depth that was sacrificed there for the individual characters as a result. Vivek in particular, in my opinion, is like the most interesting character in the book, but is also the character we see the least of on the page. Definitely gorgeous writing. It's quite different from Freshwater. Freshwater is like this is so chaotic. That's what I liked about it. This book is much more methodical than Freshwater. They're both excellent novels. So next up I've got another collection, Awayland by Ramona Ausubel. I really enjoyed this collection. This was really quite fun. There's so many like weird interesting creative concepts in here that are executed really well. You know how like when you read the back of a collection they give you like one sentence summaries of all the stories? And a lot of the time I'll see those summaries and be like, wow, this sounds amazing. Those all sound like the coolest concept I've, concepts I've ever encountered in my life. And then they all kind of fall a bit flat when I actually read them. Here I thought that she actually fully executed those really unique concepts. One thing I also really appreciated about this in contrast with other collections I've read is that it's whimsical without being reductive to like childishness or magic just for the sake of magic. So the next book I've got to talk about is a pretty chunky one. It's Betty by Tiffany McDaniel. I read this online and I wasn't expecting it to be like this giant. So this is a novel that is based on the life of the author's mother, Betty. She's the six of eight children born in the mid 1950s her dad is Cherokee, her mom is white, and of all her siblings, she's the only one who looks indigenous. All of her siblings are white passing. And she kind of becomes the bearer of her family's narrative, like as she kind of takes on knowledge and understanding of different tragedies that affect different family members. I actually read Tiffany McDaniel's debut, The Summer That Melted Everything, a couple years ago, and I really didn't like it. Something about this book intrigued me. I saw like a couple excerpts from it and I was struck by how beautiful the prose was and I wanted to give it a go. And I'm really glad that I did. While there was a large sense of disconnect for me in the summer that melted everything, this felt extremely genuine. It's a very long novel, obviously. It's very character driven, but every single thing that happens is very richly depicted. 
The main character is very well rendered. I mean, obviously the main character is based on the author's mother. It is slow paced, but it's very rich and need to be a quick paced book. Like it's more of a family study. There's a lot of relationships to understand from her relationships with her parents who are both really interesting characters, all of her siblings who are really interesting characters. They're really interesting dynamics that I'd never considered. Like her own siblings would be really racist to her. I thought it was just a very, detailed portrayal of the family. Really the only thing I didn't really like was that at the end it does catch up to The Summer That Melted Everything and basically like connects the two books. They are set in the same world, like it's actually set in the same town, but it completely feels like a different town just because of how different tonally the books are. To me it just felt like a little contrived and unnecessary, but that might just be because I didn't like The Summer That Melted Everything. It didn't impact my writing, I think it was just a personal thing. But yeah, I really enjoyed this. I think I actually even voted for it um, for the Goodreads Choice Awards. <laughs> I think lyrical prose is most effective when it comes from a very well-drawn character, and it does come from a very well-drawn character here. The next book I've got to talk about is How Much of These Heels is Gold by C. Pam Jean. We follow siblings Lucy and Sam um, beginning the night after their father passes away. Their mother passed away years earlier. They are the children of Chinese immigrants who were trying to make a living as prospectors in California during the gold rush. I have extremely mixed feelings about this book. The writing is delicious in some ways. <laughs> like, it's beautiful. There are so many triumphant lines and details that made me just kind of stop and like really appreciate the image. But I also think the prose is the book's greatest problem. The thing about the prose is sometimes it feels too avoidant. It's like extremely elusive, like it's avoiding telling us stuff that the narrative voice does know. It kind of feels like the book avoids saying what it's trying to say, which leads to an excess of subtext. As a result, I feel like I kept reading in implications that weren't actually there because so much was left to subtext when it didn't need to be. Even when it, it was the case and I was interpreting correctly, I never knew if I was interpreting correctly because the prose is just very elusive. The characters are interesting, but they're quite distant here. It's a pretty distant, like, psychic distance. I never felt really truly connected to the characters, even though on paper they are very interesting and have a lot of interesting things about them. This book is in several sections and, in my opinion, each section of the book would have functioned better on its own in a fully fleshed out form. Like we open in the present or the fictive present and then we cut back to the past and then we cut back to the past again and then we cut to the future. Each section is on its own an interesting story but they never really get the chance to build momentum and it kind of feels like the book is structured like this where there's a giant gully in the middle of backstory. I really wanted to love this more nuanced take on like a Western told from a cultural perspective that's often ignored in this historical context. The prose and the structural decisions made didn't really work for me, but I do think that like the right reader could really enjoy this. I mean, it was also long listed for the man booker. Clearly there's good things going for this book. So I've just got one more book to talk about. It's Bestiary by Kei Ming Chang. This was probably my number one most anticipated read of the year. I adore Kei Ming Chang's writing. I adore her poetry. I've read a ton of her short fiction online and it's some of my favorite. This book follows the protagonist daughter who grows a tiger tail one day and learns that each woman in her family kind of is the embodiment of a myth. It weaves together multiple generations of Taiwanese American women in this family and there's like a queer love story at the center. It really did not disappoint. I really adored this. The first thing I have to talk about in this book is the prose. I think it's hard to talk about this book without talking about the prose because the prose is so stunning. I mean, I have read Kei Ming Cheng's prose many times in her short fiction, and honestly, she might have like my favorite prose style. Pretty much every page has a line that completely blows my mind and that I had to just like stop and like take in because of how good it was. It's a non-linear family saga, but it does so in a very unique way. I thought it was a great example of like meta storytelling, like because it's a book about myth and it's done in a very meta way. Like there are sections where the main character daughter is like footnoting. I also thought the relationship, the love story between daughter and Ben was one of the most unique romance plot lines I have read. I thought that the way their relationship developed and their dynamic was extremely unique and not 
a character dynamic I had seen before. Obviously it's extremely common for a book to have a romantic subplot. This one was very uniquely handled. The book is so magical that it maybe seems disjointed. I didn't really have a huge problem with that though, but there is a lot going on. It's very chaotic. Uh, but personally, I mostly appreciated that. For my most anticipated read of the year, it really did not disappoint. Thank you guys so much for watching. I had a great time chatting about these books. As always, I would love to hear what you guys have been reading recently so that my never-ending TBR can, t can continue to grow to the point where it devours me whole and there is nothing left of my corporeal form. If you have any questions, you can always send me an ask on Tumblr and I will see you in another video.